Hey guys, Chris here with The Good Old Gamer. So we're just a few weeks away from the Zen 2 Ryzen 3000 CPUs from launching. And there's a lot of people out there wondering if now is the time to upgrade and what should they buy. There's also a lot of people out there that are new to PC gaming and they're wondering what CPU makes the most sense for them. And that's what I wanted to tackle here today. I wanted to quantify what the current generation console's performance is like relative to regular PC parts. So I sat down and figured out kind of a way that seems to make a lot of sense. And I want to share that with you guys here today. Now, I do want to stress that this is for people that are looking to basically get 60 frame per second average gaming. Now, you can always double the numbers that I go over in this video if you're a high refresh gamer, because CPU performance does scale pretty linearly as long as you're not exceeding cores and stuff like that. So I think I came up with a way that you can just look at some numbers on an average review, any review site, and figure out if that CPU is going to be powerful enough to do what you want and get that 60 frame per second experience. Alrighty, so to start off, we have to quantify how powerful the Jaguar cores inside of the consoles are and how that relates in the PC world. So how do we do that? So I started by going over here to Wikipedia and checking out which consoles or what and what they're looking like. Okay, so starting off with the PS4, this is basically the weakest of all of the mainstream consoles right now in terms of CPU. Even the Xbox One is a little bit faster at uh, 1.75 gigahertz versus the 1.6 gigahertz of the PS4. Now we do know that this has two modules, four cores each, so eight cores total. It does have a grand total of four megabytes of L2 cache. Now, this is something that we can't quite go one-to-one -one with, so the numbers we're going to be looking at, we do want to get worst-case scenario for PC because we want to make sure that we're getting at least a 60 frames per second experience. So scrolling on down, we can see that there were Jaguar cores used in PC parts in the Socket AM1 CPUs. These are the Athlon 5370, 5350, 5150, now this one really caught my attention because it's clocked at 1.6 gigahertz as well. Now the big thing is it does have more L2 cache, which means that the IPC on these should technically be a little bit higher than what we see inside of the consoles. Also to note at 2.05 gigahertz, this comes very, very close to the 2.13 gigahertz on the PS4 Pro. So it is 100 megahertz slower, but it also has a little bit more cache so this CPU right here can also be used as PS4 Pro level of performance on CPU. So a little Google search later, looks like a non-tech actually did some benchmark numbers on the 5350 and 5150 CPUs. So that's awesome. Now to figure out CPU IPC, typically the best benchmark out there is Cinebench. Now this only relates specifically to this particular program, but overall, from my own IPC testing, Cinebench is a realistic, real-world comparison of what CPUs are capable of. Now, for the most useful benchmark, using Cinebench R15 is the way to go. This is what everybody else uses, so this way we can compare these numbers to other CPUs out there. So as we can see, the single core performance on the 5150, this is the 1.6 gigahertz CPU, comes out at 35. And then at the 5350, we have 45. So this is close to what the PS4 Pro would be looking like. Now, once again, it does have more cache. So the PS4 would probably be a little bit slower, but not by a lot. Now, these are four core CPUs. So we can see what their multi-thread CPU scores look like. So we have the 5350 coming in at 164. And then we have the 5150 at 129. So if we take the single core performance of, let's say, the 5150, which would be equivalent to the PlayStation 4's 1.6 gigahertz, we're looking at a score of 35, then you have eight cores. So theoretical maximum performance per core, somewhere around 280. Now, if we take a look at the multi-core performance of 129, then we multiply by two because these are four cores, and obviously the consoles have eight that comes up to being 258. So it's a little bit less than the 280 number if we go straight off of the single core performance. 
Now, because we want to build in a little bit of wiggle room and worst case scenario, I'm actually going to run off of the single core performance. Also, we know that consoles are heavily optimized to utilize every ounce of performance. So if we take 35 and we multiply by eight again, we're back at 280. So we know that this is going to be designed to run games at approximately 30 frames per second average. Now, this isn't going to hit 30 frames per second in all games. Some will dip below. Really stressful games, probably like Cyberpunk 2077, will go a little bit lower. However, if we wanted to go with an average of 60 frames per second, CPU-wise, all we need to do is multiply by 2 again. And that comes up with a Cinebench multi-thread score of somewhere in the neighborhood of about 560 points should get you at least a rough average of about 60 frames per second from your CPU. Now that will also come down to game per game optimization. So a little bit of wiggle room in there might not be a bad idea. So let's take a look instead and use the PS4 Pro-ish numbers. So instead of using 35, we take 45 times eight. So that comes up to 360. So we're about 80 points ahead of the uh, 5150, which would be something like the baseline PS4. So then we multiply this by two, and then that gets us to 720 multi-thread Cinebench points to make sure that we can get somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 frames per second. So that gives us a pretty good range of where we kind of want our CPUs to be if you want to make sure that you have a 60 frames per second average throughout most of your gaming experience. Somewhere between 560 and 720 would be a pretty solid range for that. So what kind of CPUs can sort of fall within this range? Well, I went over here to TechSpot and checked out Steve Walton's numbers here. And uh, this is on his 1800X review. And uh, we can see that he used some older CPUs. So this way we can kind of see where those land. So you can see the i5-2500K at stock is not quite pushing that 560 to 720 Cinebench score that we're looking for. Now, of course, you could always overclock this and get you there. But if you wanted to go ahead and save a lot of money, you know, you get something like an i5-2500 non-K with a non-overclocking board. This isn't going to quite get you there. And we can see that the i3-7350K also isn't within that range. However, once we look at the Haswell i5s, we are now within that 560 to 720 range. And this makes a lot of sense. We know that the Haswell i5s still run games today just fine. They do have lower 1% and 0.1% lows, but it's still a pretty solid gaming experience overall, especially with something like FreeSync enabled. Now, moving a little bit up the stack, we can see the Sandy and Ivy Bridge i7s coming in at 664 and 7 or 671. That's going to put us right in that middle, right between the 560 and 720 that we were looking for. These CPUs are still perfectly fine, even at stock speeds for gaming here today. Now, the Haswell i7s on up, now we're starting to get into a territory where you could look into things like high refresh gaming and things like that if that's your thing. But if you're just trying to get into PC gaming, these are unnecessary to get a decent gaming experience. Every CPU from here on up is going to be more than enough to handle gaming. Now, I was curious and I wanted to see where the Ryzen 2200G landed on this chart. And it hits right around the bare minimum that I would recommend for a CPU at this point in time. Coming in at 554 points. So that's twice as much as the 1.6 gigahertz baseline PS4 Pro. So this should deliver a smooth 60 frames per second average in the vast majority of titles out there. Now, if you look at something like the 2400G at 821 points, this is gonna deliver a much, much better and smoother gaming experience overall. However, if we're taking a look at that, this is all you would really need for the next few years, which is really, really awesome because these are not very expensive. And then putting things in perspective, something like the Ryzen 5 1600 at 1127 Cinebench points is well beyond what you would need for 60 frames per second gaming. Now, one of the catalysts for this video was my good buddy Phil over here at Phil's Computer Lab. He's been taking a look at older platforms and their six core and eight core CPU offerings that are very, very cheap nowadays. Now, the motherboards aren't so cheap, but you can get these CPUs at a very, very good price. And I wanted a way that you can kind of figure out if these CPUs would be good enough to last the rest of this current generation of consoles. 
And that's the reason why I wanted to put a hard number to it. All right, so looking over all those numbers, we can see that it doesn't really take all that much to game with current gen games. I mean, they're very, very CPU bound, so it doesn't take a whole lot to get 60 frame per second. Now to go double that, you need a pretty strong CPU, of course. So if you're looking for high refresh gaming, you're always gonna need the latest and greatest, but the average gamer out there is gonna be pretty happy with 60 frames per second on more demanding titles like Cyberpunk 2077. I think that's gonna be just fine, just like Witcher 3 is just fine at 60 FPS. Now, games that run at 60 frames per second on these uh, on the consoles, those will be able to run high refresh on the same level of CPU because you'll get double the frames per second available to you on the PC. So you don't really need anything that crazy. Now to quantify this even further, I used my own IPC test numbers to see exactly where uh, these CPUs land, the Jaguar cores in, that are used in these consoles. So looking at this, so we had the 1.6 gigahertz CPU coming in at 35 single thread score. So if we double that approximately, that'll get us around the three gigahertz that I use in my IPC tests. It's a little higher, so that's why I said around. But if we take a look at this chart here, if you look around 70 on single thread, that means these Jaguar cores are actually about on par with the Athlon 64s. So that's pretty old technology. That's back 2003, 2004 era that these CPUs are using. Now, of course, they have eight cores instead of one or two, like the Athlon 64s did, but this pretty much just proves that you don't need a very, very strong CPU to game. That's one of the expenses that you don't really need to worry about. You can get yourself pretty much a Haswell level i5 or the Ryzen 3 2200G level, or even something like a Ryzen 3 1200 would probably be just fine as a baseline. Now, Steve from Hardware Unboxed, he did this video the other day where he went over basically using older Xeons and stuff like that. You can, you can do that. I mean, it definitely will work, and that's something that I'm gonna be looking into here in the near future. But in that video, his recommendation was just buy an AM4 platform. It makes a lot of sense for a lot of reasons because you can get something today that's inexpensive like a 2200G. It's gonna work just fine throughout this generation. And then next generation, by the time that you do need a new CPU, we know the next generation consoles are using Zen 2 CPUs. So you could just upgrade two or three years from now when you do need that extra performance for gaming and they're gonna be super cheap. So if you look at something like the 16 core 3950X, it's coming out at $749 later this year, two and a half to three years from now, what do you think that'll cost then? It'll be significantly discounted at that point. So more than likely you could upgrade to even the today's best CPUs for probably only a few hundred dollars when you actually need them. And that's the reason why I wanted to do this video. You can save a bunch of money by not really investing that much into your CPU, but instead buying the proper platform that can be upgraded makes more sense. And in the long term, just buy what you need when you need it. Now, of course, for everybody out there that does other things than gaming, you know, obviously you're gonna need whatever CPU resources that you need to do what you do. This video is geared towards people that gaming is the most demanding thing that they do on their PC. You know, they might do some office work, some Excel, some PowerPoint, browse the internet, and then they game. You know, there's a lot of people out there, that's what they use their PC for, basic work, and then their hobby, which is gaming, and nothing else. Not everybody makes YouTube videos. So for those people out there, you don't need to invest a lot of money. If you already have a CPU that's in that range, that 560 to 720 range, you're just fine. And for you high refresh gamers out there, just double those numbers. Uh, so go uh, 1120 to uh, 1440, and somewhere within that range, you'll be good. Now, now with that in mind, remember that if you scale past an eight core CPU here today, it's not going to have the same effect. As most games are not going to take advantage of more than eight cores at this point in time. So I would keep that within the realm of quad cores up through about eight core CPUs, that'd be my recommendation because those will do really well. So if you're looking at an old Xeon, that's a six core 12 thread, just make sure that it's within that 560 to 720 Cinebench score range and it should do you just fine. 
Hopefully this helps answer a lot of questions out there. If you're unsure if you need to upgrade or what sort of level processor you're going to need for gaming in the future, don't worry about future and next gen games. Like I said, if you have a platform that can be upgraded like AM4, it's not a problem. Even like the Z390 and Z370 boards, you have access to eight core CPUs. And by the time that you really, really do need that, they're gonna be much cheaper two or three years down the road. So I wouldn't worry about future proofing here today. It doesn't make a lot of sense because you can spend much less right now and then spend much less later. And it's still going to be cheaper than investing all that money right now. But that's just my thoughts. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. If you like this video, please hit that like button. Please subscribe. Please share with friends. That really does help me out. And if you want to help out the channel for as little as $1 a month, you can become a patron, chat with me on Discord, and talk to me directly about this kind of stuff. I really do enjoy those conversations. And that's all I have for today. And I will catch you guys in the next video.